Hi everyone, welcome back to the EV Puzzle. Yep, today I want to give you an update on July's solar generation and usage and how it's been for me. So for those that are considering going solar, uh, you may be interested in some of the detail. If you look at what happens in each month and how it's going, you can appreciate perhaps uh, how that's going to work for you. For those that have already got solar, yeah, it's great for a comparison, isn't it? To see how you're doing versus how I'm doing and what I'm doing with my solar. So, uh, this month, July, that's just gone, 2019, we generated 527 units of electricity, kilowatt hours. Um, that's the fourth month in a row where we've been generating more than 500 kilowatt hours. And for me, that's, that's a significant number, it's a significant barrier to say that I've had a really good month um, above 500. How that impacts me is, when I'm at that sort of level, I can charge the car, heat the hot water, very low consumption in the house, hardly any grid usage, and basically I've got some excess that I could be exporting. So at 500 plus kilowatt hours a month, I can do everything that I want, pretty much, and also have some export, which means in the future perhaps I could have a battery as well. Back in the winter months of only a couple of hundred kilowatt hours, then I'm limited, aren't I? So I've got to use some grid usage to top that up to heat the hot water or charge the car and a variety of those things. Anyway, so July. July had 13 days over 20 kilowatt hours generation. So to me, that's 13 very good, clear, sunny days. Still not the maximum. We had 14 one month. But that's 527 versus 533, which was the peak in May. For the same number of days in the month, 31, that's a fairly good comparison. And only seven days where it was really dull under 10 kilowatt hours generated. So that's how I'm judging mine. I've got my upper level of 500 and how many days are above 20 kilowatt hours and how many days are below 10 kilowatt hours. And that tells me how the month has been, you know, uh, weather-wise, how many dull days versus bright sunny days. Still, April seems a fantastic month. May being the highest generation, but July still really good. August has started excellently. No um, really peak high days, um, but still good solid generation every day. So at this rate, if we carry on, August is going to be yet another 500 kilowatt hour generation month. So yeah, solar is looking good so far. What have I done though? Um, well, this month in July, I wanted to do something different. Um, I've had the system since January this year, and by now, six months in, I really wanted to say that I'm getting used to it. Uh, I can take it for granted in some respects, and I'm not tracking it in minute detail every single day. So I wanted to let go. So, yeah, this month I've been trying not to be OCD and not to be as economical as I can. And quite frankly, that's quite difficult because if you're aware that you could do something or turn something off or change the time of when you do something and save some energy and do it more efficiently, then by not doing it, I'm deliberately being inefficient. And that seems to go against my being. It seems to go against me completely. Um, I find it really hard not to be efficient. So I've actually had to fight it and almost deliberately be inefficient. Because if you're aware that you can be efficient and it's right in front of you to do something to be efficient, but you choose not to do it, then you are being inefficient. You're being wasteful. It's not very good for the environment. So the start of the month in July, uh, that's what I was trying, but pretty much I was failing because it was going against my nature. But it's taken towards the second half of the month before that's really kicked in. And what I can see is during the months where I tried really hard to be as economical as I can, um, I very, very rarely had a day, an entire day of less than one unit of electricity usage from the grid. Uh, it was more between one and two and maybe two and three in peak days. Whereas this month in July, what I'm noticing is it's not the zero to one and one to two. It's more two to three and three to four. So I've definitely increased a unit or two units of um, grid usage by trying hard. Uh, that, that seems um, a bit bizarre, but let's say two units of electricity is the difference between my attitude of being OCD and uh, being efficient with everything. Uh, versus not. Well, two units is 26 pence. 26 pence a day times 30 is, well, let's let's call it a tenner, shall we? Ten pounds a month is what it will cost me to be inefficient and switch off and forget about um, the solar. 
So that's £120 a year through making an effort for the entire year. And some of it does come down to that. It's how much effort can you put into doing it? And it depends how your mind works. If your mind is focusing on the numbers and efficiency more often, then it's not a big deal because it's there in front of you. It's actually harder to not be efficient. Whereas if you just don't think about it and the solar panels are there, something that's delivering you some savings, then you're not really noticing anyway. So that £120 a year approximately is the difference that I find in being uh, deliberately efficient versus deliberately not worrying about it and doing whatever I want when I want. So what are the sort of examples that I mean? Well, one of the efficiency things that I can do first thing in the morning, um, when it's say half past seven in the morning, there's not that much sun coming through. I'm probably generating about three, four hundred watts of electricity at that time in the morning. So if I switch the kettle on, which is 2.2 kilowatts to boil a kettle for a cup of tea, I'm using grid usage. But if I turn a hob on and boil a pan of water at a lower setting, it might take 10, 15 minutes to actually get there but I can do it for zero energy usage from the grid. So depending on how OCD I am, I can make my morning cup of tea and not use any grid usage. And how much does that use? Well, about 0 0.1, 0 0.1 of a unit, but again, multiply that by 30 days, uh, that's three units of electricity just for boiling a kettle in the morning. And all of those things add up, so just doing one thing different is a small chunk, but repeating that small thing many times during the day you do save units of electricity. So yeah, during July, I haven't worried about it. I've just switched the kettle on. Um, I also haven't waited for a uh, cloud to pass before I turn the oven on. You know, sometimes if you know it's a bright sunny day and the cloud's just gone over, you know, why turn it on just at the moment when there's no sun? And the difference is whether it's convenient or whether you're trying to be efficient and trying not to use grid energy. So yeah, I have been OCD in the months gone past during July. I switched off a lot more and relaxed a lot more. <laughs> we just had some birds go past. Uh, yeah, I've got a different view from my gazebo today. Um, let's try and share that with you. If I move out of the way, um, hopefully the camera will refocus. There you go. So you can have a better view of the countryside behind me and the wildlife fluttering past. And there we go, it's back in focus again. So where were we? Yeah, we've generated over 500 kilowatts. Uh, it's kilowatt hours get it right Nigel um, it's been a really good month um, but there's also been a, a couple of oddities you can see here in this graph I've used a lot more grid energy this month than I normally do a lot more and that's not just me being relaxed and doing things whenever I want to and ignoring the efficiency it's also as a result of some power cuts we had some really bad thunderstorms here some torrential rain but electrical storms and during two days of those electrical storms, we basically had a couple of power cuts. But these power cuts that I had had a result um, overnight for me. I'd left the Kona Electric plugged in. I'd left the Kona Electric plugged in overnight. And uh, I was waiting for the next sunny day to come up the next day and start charging. I just hadn't bothered unplugging it. And because we had a power cut, the zappy charger that I have um, powered off, restarted. And when it restarted, it clicked into fast mode, not eco++, which meant that it wasn't waiting for the sun to come up and to start to charge from solar. It just decided to start charging instantly or as fast as it could. So at about um, 7 kilowatts, well, maybe it was actually less because I might have had it set to minimum on the Kona Electric. So I might have been generating at about 3.6, 3.8 kilowatts constantly throughout the night from about 11 at night through until, let's say, 5 in the morning, something like that, when the car was full. And I, I didn't want to fill it up. It was sat at, oh, I don't know, 60%, um, let's say, and I was happy to gradually let it creep up during the week using solar-only energy. And, of course, it went on full blast, charged 100%, and uh, not what I wanted. But that's why I've used so much grid energy this month, because um, I would say 30, 35 kilowatt hours of energy came from the grid just to charge the car on that one night, which uh, ruined my statistics, ruined my numbers. But hey, you know, these things happen. So I've learned in uh, thunderstorms, electrical storms, I need to unplug my car, not for safety reasons or anything like that, but just because I do not want the car to charge from the grid, not when I don't have to. The other things that are going on solar-wise, I'm still investigating, and I'll have some news soon, I hope, about uh, an expansion of my solar array. So I'll get more panels, more kilowatts coming off the roof. Um, I have investigated going for a battery as well. But, yeah, frankly, 
I can't justify it. And it's because I can't find a sweet spot of a compromise between price and functionality. The ones that I can afford and I can justify as a whim to myself because they don't cost justify, they don't provide enough functionality. I can't have enough um, instantaneous kilowatt power from them, so I need to spend too much money. So at the moment, I've ruled out batteries. And I like the idea of modular batteries. I like the idea of batteries where you add the second one, but then you get twice as much um, optimum power from that. So instead of, say, getting two kilowatts of sustained power generation from it, you can or output from it, you can have four kilowatts. And that, that's the sort of level that I'm looking for. Three to four minimum is what I need to power you know, the oven, the car charging, uh, some major appliances. That's what I need from the battery. And uh, I just can't find that sweet spot yet of compromise between price and functionality and what it would actually deliver. And yes, I have looked at the entire market. I've looked at pretty much all the ones I'm interested in. Uh, part of the issue, as I said in a previous video, is not just what you can find on the open market, but what you can find an installer knows about and will install for you. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a minefield out there looking for uh, batteries. The other thing that I haven't concluded yet is uh, yeah, automatically heating my hot water. I'm still stubborn. I still turn the immersion heater on manually. Um, stage two could be putting a uh, timer in so that between, let's say, 11 and 1 o'clock, uh, where my peak hours are, I charge automatically. Uh, sorry, not charge. I heat the hot water automatically. And that, in theory, would work well for me. That on many days it would be optimum and it wouldn't cost very much. On other days that were dull, yes, I'd be consuming more grid energy. So on balance, I'd be saving from using oil and I'd be using just green grid energy and just my solar usage. So that's good, but I'm not optimizing it. So to install a solar diverter that would divert all the small bits of excess solar that I have and put that to the hot water, that would be more efficient. But for me, those, well, it's between about £250 and £400 to get one of these, whether I go for, I think I mentioned in a previous video, a Solok or um, an iBoost, or the My Energy, um, which one is it? Eddy. So if I went for all those three, it's somewhere between 250 and 400 pounds installed. And that's, that's a huge amount of money, not for the savings that I could make versus oil, but for the difference between manually turning it on and turning it off. So most of it is about convenience, not about the money saving. And 400 pounds is do you know it's it's too much you know i know my energy have got some functionality in there and uh it's a nice it's a nice thing to have but it is just too much money it doesn't really justify so i am still evaluating in my mind which one to go for and there's there's something in my head that's telling me practically i would be better going for the cheaper solic solution and having a timer on it as well and using the timer to optimize between when I charge a car and when I uh, heat my hot water but I, I haven't quite decided it all in my mind it's it's what other features does the zappy provide does the eddy provide along with the zappy and it's the prioritization between the two that seems to be the big issue but you now I do hear with some customers that they're talking about which way they go do I want to prioritise my hot water or do I want to prioritise charging my car and do I need that to be flexibly configurable? And is that configurable via the My Energy app if I went with the Eddy? So it's still not absolutely straight in my mind which way I want to go. So at the moment, yeah, I'm still flicking the switch and turning it on manually at the moment. And, you know, it's working. It's a bit of a pain in the bum when I don't have a sunny day and I've resisted turning it on and then I haven't got any hot water. That... <laughs> <laughs> that is a bit of a pain. It would have been nice to um, do that. The other thing is I'm still not fully um, convinced that charging, at, sorry, heating your hot water at say 500 watts, if you have 500 watts of excess solar, then that gets diverted to your immersion heater. I'm not convinced that that heats it enough to actually heat your hot water up to the right temperature throughout the day. It might keep it warm, but would it actually heat it up? And my thought was, what, what's the difference between saving all those 500 watts into a battery and then outputting that energy in a larger 3 kilowatt power output into the immersion heater and heating it more quickly? Is that more efficient? Would I use exactly the same amount of kilowatt hours in doing it slowly versus doing it quickly? And, you know, all of that isn't quite straight in my head. Um, I'm listening to other people um, that have got the Eddy device and how that's working for them. But to most people, they install it and they have hot water and they forget about it. And well, I want more than that. I want to understand more than that. I want to understand the consequence of 
doing it one way or doing it another. So yes, it might ultimately heat the hot water and the majority of the time it does it all, but what about when it is just drip feeding in small amounts? Is that of any good? Does it actually work? Or would I be better ignoring having, um, let's say, an eddy device and saving all of those excess four or 500 watts of solar energy and putting them into a battery and therefore letting the battery hold the energy that I'm then going to heat the hot water with? So there's my update for the month. Um, yep, still switching the immersion on manually. Um, I've researched batteries and concluded I can't find an optimal configuration. And uh, yes, I'm still progressing, adding more solar panels to my array, and there'll be more news on that shortly, uh, I hope. Thanks for watching, everyone. Thanks for subscribing. I hope there was some interesting information there for you. Uh, if this is the first time you've seen my channel and seen this video, uh, go back and watch some of the other uh, solar videos that I've done. Hopefully there's a playlist of them, and it should make more sense if you see the journey that I've had from start to finish on installing solar and how that's affected me. And I hope that helps other people in choosing to go solar, because, yeah, adding solar panels on your roof if you've got an electric car it is the right thing to do. It's the best way to power your car. So if you've got space on your roof, I recommend you just do it. Uh, yeah, it costs a couple of thousand pounds, you know, a few thousand pounds to do, but it is worth the investment. Thanks for watching, everyone. Take care for now and see you again soon. Bye-bye.